Hello, everybody. We'll get started in the lecture in a minute. Any Dodger fans out there? All right. I grew up in uh, Dodger country, so I was pretty happy to see the game yesterday. Let's keep it up. Okay. So today we are going to finish, try to finish our lecture on innate immunity. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, just to start off with a couple of announcements. First is for the recordings. Our friend Sean there in the back has listened to the feedback uh, provided by me and others and is now re-rendered the, the videos on YouTube in, in a different format that's more focused, more close up on the screen so you can see the, the screen better and also the um, pointer that I use. And there's a little bit more close ups of me for better or for worse. So uh, you can try those and again compare them to UCI Replay. It seems as if the audio on UCI Replay isn't so great but you can decide which or use both for your studying at home. All right, and then for the other announcement is for extension students, you should start bringing up your paperwork for me to sign uh, so that when space is open in the course at the end of the ad period that BioSci can add you to the class. So, oh, the last announcement is I'm going to post the first practice quiz this afternoon. I'm going to include questions from the first two chapters, uh, the first four lectures. They basically correspond to questions that have been on previous exams. And the point is, is to help you prepare for the exams, to give you an idea of the content of the exams, the format of the questions, uh, so you know a bit more what to expect when you actually come here for the midterm and the final. And a week after I post these quizzes, I will post an answer key. So you have some time to take the quizzes. They're not graded. I don't monitor who's doing them or not. They're, they're just uh, downloads for you. So you can take them at home and then look at the key after it's posted. All right, with that, I will get into today's lecture. And most of today's lecture is going to be devoted to the complement system. But before we get there, we need to talk about a very important and interesting process, which is how neutrophils get out of the bloodstream and into inflamed tissues. And uh, I want to start by defining the term homing. Homing is a general term that's used in immunology to describe the movement of some cell from the, the vasculature, from the bloodstream, into a tissue. It could be into a lymph node, like a T cell or a B cell, homing from the blood into the lymph node. In this case, it's a neutrophil homing from the blood into an inflamed tissue. Uh, it sounds like it's going home, but it isn't necessarily there, where they started. It's just the place that they're now being directed to go. So it's a general term for movement out of the vasculature. Uh, and the other term in that title there is diapodesis, and we'll come back to what that means later on. In order for a neutrophil to home to an inflamed tissue, they have to interact with the vascular endothelium, which basically means the wall, the cells lining the blood vessels. And that interaction changes during the process of homing. And it involves a number of, of pairs of molecules that are re really complementary pairs of adhesion molecules. Adhesion molecules for this course are defined as cell surface proteins or the carbohydrates that are decorating those proteins that are important for cells to stick to each other or for cells to stick to extracellular matrix. There are four structural classes of these kinds of proteins that we're going to be concerned with uh, in this lecture. And the first are the selectins. This one shown here is called L-selectin. These, as the name implies, are lectins, which is a general term for a protein that binds carbohydrates. And the, the selectins that are involved in homing of neutrophils have specificity for these, these oligosaccharides indicated by pentagons and hexagons here uh, that are decorating proteins. Uh, in this case, the protein would be on the vascular surface. And it's a class of proteins known as vascular addressins. So the selectin uh, is on the neutrophil and the vascular addressin is on the vascular endothelial cell. Uh, and it's called an addressin because it addresses or talks to the neutrophil and other cells coming through, and it does throw through these carbohydrates that are uh, added to the protein. So those are the first two. And the second two classes are down here. One are the integrins. You may be familiar with integrins. They're widely distributed throughout the body in different cell types. They are made up of alpha and beta chains, and they uh, Often, their ligands are members of what's known as the immunoglobulin superfamily, or Ig superfamily. So that's the fourth class. An example uh, is shown here. 
And the integrin we're going to talk about in today's lecture and also when we discuss T cells is called LFA1. Again, it has two chains. And then the immunoglobulin-like molecule that it binds to is called ICAM1. So again, selectins, vasculodressins, integrins, and Ig-like molecules. They're called Ig-like because they have domains that resemble domains of, of antibodies that we'll discuss in, discuss in the lecture next Wednesday. So the next figure, 233, is, is a figure that you will see in every immunology or hematology textbook. Uh, and it's a classical description of the, the different steps, the four steps of neutrophils leaving the bloodstream and going to the inflamed tissue. And together that process is known as extravasation, the process of migrating out of the blood capillaries and into tissues. And it starts with what's known as rolling adhesion. A lot of the other cells like red blood cells and lymphocytes just are going through at a fast pace as the blood flows. Neutrophils have on their surface the, uh, these uh, carbohydrates. And then in this example, there's selectins actually on the surface of the vascular cells. And what happens is that there's enough of affinity here that the neutrophils that bump into the walls kind of stop a little bit and then fall off and kind of roll along. And that is called rolling adhesion. It slows down the neutrophils, so they're going a lot slower than other cells that are just passing through the bloodstream. So I think I, I said previously that the selectin is on the neutrophil and the vascular addressin is on the vasculature. Uh, that might be true for some pairs, but a very important process that starts all this, the selectin is on the, the vascular endothelial cells, the vascular addressin is on the neutrophil, and there's a particular name for the carbohydrate linkages that's shown here that you won't have to remember for the exam, uh, but just so that you know when you look at this figure, this refers to something called Cialo Lewis X, uh, and uh, maybe you'll have to memorize that for the MCATs, I don't know, but for this class, just know that there's carbohydrates on the proteins on the surface of the neutrophil that stick to the selectins, and that slows them down and they sort of roll along. And normally, that nothing will happen at that point. What changes is this, the second step of type binding occurs if there's local inflammation and if chemokines have been released. Now, you should remember this chemokine CXCL8, which is released by macrophages uh, that have perhaps encountered a, a bacteria somewhere in this tissue and they've released the chemokine. Some will get stuck on extracellular matrix. Some will diffuse out and eventually make its way to the surface, the inner surface of the lumen of the vasculature. And as the neutrophil rolls along, if boom, its receptor for CXCL8, this, this G protein coupled receptor called the CXCL8 receptor, binds to C, uh, CXCL8 displayed here, then something changes. What happens is that the integrin LFA1 changes its affinity for ICAM1. So ICAM1 was here all along. Uh, it's this long uh, molecule shown here in kind of orange pink. And uh, before, as it was rolling along, it's not shown here, but those interactions of LFA1 with ICAM1 were low affinity and not enough to slow down the neutrophils further. But the first thing that happens when CXCL8 receptor binds CXCL8 is there's a, the signal that, that increases the affinity of LFA1 for ICAM1, and now you get this tight binding and it stops rolling. Okay, so then the third step is diapedesis which is the physical process of actually crossing the blood vessel wall. There are these tight junctions in between the vascular uh, endothelial cells, of course, so that things don't leak out. But the neutrophils find ways to break those junctions and to squeeze through, uh, and then eventually to reach this grayish area that's diagram gray. It's called the basement membrane. It has uh, proteins and lipids that form an additional barrier to anything trying to leave the vasculature but the neutrophils will secrete proteases that digest the basement membrane, allowing it to finish the process of squeezing into the tissues. And then it'll follow the gradient of CXCL8 and migrate in the fourth process, migrate towards the source of the CXCL8, which is a, usually a macrophage that's sensed to bacteria and is secreting chemokines. So rolling adhesion with selectins and vascular addressins, tight binding through integrin, Ig, uh, like molecule LFA1, ICAM1, diapedesis, squeezing through the blood vessel walls and breaking down the basement membrane, 
and then finally migration towards the source of the chemokine and eventually towards the bacteria or other pathogen to destroy them. This on the right is just a picture of a neutrophil with, again, these uh, two lobes to the nucleus shown here. It's an electron micrograph of a neutrophil that's about to start squeezing through two endothelial cells. Any questions about neutrophil homing and diapedesis? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so the, the, this, the problem with this figure is confusing. This is supposed to be, this is the neutrophil, this is the vascular tissue. Um, it's the integrin on the neutrophil that binds to the ICAM one on the, on the vascular cell. They show the selectin being on the neutrophil and the vascular addressin being on the, on the endothelial cell, but in reality, the most important pair has the selectin on the other side, on the vascular cells, and the carbohydrates on a protein on a neutrophil. So that's why it's confusing. There are other pairs not discussed in this particular example uh, where the selectin is on this side. In fact, for T cells and B cells that express L selectin, uh, that's the important selectin molecules on the T cell and the vascular addressin is on the cells lining the lymph node. Does that clear it up? All right, are we ready for a compliment? Now, every immunology professor in the country dreads the compliment lecture because they know that the students are going to get, uh, they're going to hate the nomenclature and they're going to get confused and they're going to think it's complicated. Uh, but let me just tell you that the compliment system is, is more than just a bunch of proteins with numbers. It's absolutely essential to so many different facets of the immune system that we really have to plow through and understand it. Uh, and uh, in order to be immunologists and to, to get what really happens in immune responses. And the more we learn about the complement system, the more we realize it's involved in so many processes that we didn't even imagine uh, even a few years ago. Nevertheless, what we'll focus on in this lecture are the basic functions of the complement system and how they are achieved. So bear with me. Stop, ask questions if you need to, and be aware that there's nothing we can do about the nomenclature. It's been around for 20, 25 years. Nobody has tried to change it, uh, or if they have, they've been unsuccessful. So we are just going to go with what we have and try to make the best of it. The name complement comes from uh, the part of the serum or the plasma that complements the function of the antibody, that uh, improves the function of the antibody. And it's just basically a set of soluble proteins that are released and made by constantly by the liver and then are present in the blood. They get into the lymph because they get out of the vasculature, and they're present in the extracellular fluid of all tissues, just basically ready to respond to foreign pathogens. And figure 2.3 shows the most important thing that happens, the first step of complement activation, which is called complement fixation. And it basically involves cleavage of a protein called C3 so that you generate a small fragment which recruits phagocytes along with CXCL8 and uh, another fragment of complement later on. These are the most important proteins that lead to vascular changes and recruitment of neutrophils. But the second po important part is that you, be, you get a covalent attachment of this larger fragment known as C3B that covalently attaches to the bacteria. And that marks this for phagocytosis. Uh, and that process of covering the bacteria or the other pathogens with complement fragments is known as opsonization. Okay, so if you go then to figure 2.5, it shows that there are three pathways of complement activation which all lead to the same process of cleavage of C3, C3 to form C3A and C3B, and C3B being covalently bound to the surface components of the pathogen. The three pathways are up here, shown alternative. We'll start by talking about that. Then the lectin pathway and the classical pathway, which is called classical because it was, for, it was the first one to be defined and studied. Uh, but it's really the last one that comes into play in immune response. And we'll start to talk about the classical pathway, which can be activated by acute phase proteins like C-reactive protein. And later on, we'll come back to it when we talk about the functions of antibodies.
They differ in their mechanisms of pathogen recognition, but they all converge at the same stage to cleave C3. They all use, or they use different protein complexes to cleave C3, and these are called C3 convertases. And we'll, we will talk about the components of the different C3 convertases, and those will be important for you to know and to memorize. And lastly, as we'll see, in the course of an immune response, the alternative pathway is the first to act. If necessary, the lectin pathway uh, will come into play later. And even later, if the pathogen hasn't been cleared, then you get the acute phase response and adaptive immune system uh, components, which can lead to activation of the classical pathway. The vast majority of complement activation events occurring all the time as you deal with potential pathogens are dealt with by the alternative pathway. Uh, and that's it. You don't even get to these later stages. Now, the three functions of complement activation, one is recruitment of inflammatory cells, like neutrophils, uh, and, uh, and new phagocytes like um, monocytes, which will come into the neighborhood and become macrophages. The second is opsonization, which facilitates phagocytosis. And the third is complement components can literally poke holes or perforate the membrane of pathogens. People get confused when they see this because they think only the classical pathway leads to perforation and only the alternative pathway leads to recruitment. Don't look at this figure that way. All of them converge here and then all three pathways by cleaving C3 and releasing C3A and C3B binding, all, no matter how you get to here, all three outcomes occur. Just want to clarify that. And together, these three functions of complement <clears throat> lead to the death of the pathogen. As I mentioned, there are new and emerging functions of complement that we learn about every day. Uh, we won't focus on these unless I specifically mention them later in the class. So let's start with the recognition mechanisms. I just want to make some definitions and, and discuss a concept before we get started. First thing to understand about complement is that, as with many enzymes that circulate in your blood, the clotting factors and so on, many of these are, are, are proteases. They're proteolytic enzymes, but they circulate in an inactive form known as a zymogen. It has the ability to cleave itself or other proteins, but it's not active until something happens. And C3 is interesting because it has an internal bond called a thioester bond which is exposed after C3 is cleaved into C3A and C3B. It's normally buried inside the protein, and so it's not exposed to any nucleophiles. But as soon as it's exposed to a nucleophile, it's very unstable. So it's considered a high energy bond. And the, by far the most common uh, enzymatic or non-enzymatic reaction that occurs is chemical reaction is that water that's around through a nucleophilic attack will cleave the thioester bond, leading to a free uh, sulpidyl group and a carboxyl group here. And this is an inactive fragment that just floats away and is eventually degraded. But if the C3B with the thioester bond happens to be close to the surface of a pathogen that has a nucleophile, either uh, you know, a, a negative or positive uh, type of nu nucleophile, you can lead to it. That leads to attack. And now you get a covalent bond Again, the sulfhydryl group, but now instead of a carboxyl group from hydrolysis, you get an attachment to some chemical group on the surface of the pathogen. And this is the covalent binding that I was talking about. So how does the alternative pathway get started? There's a figure in the textbook, figure 2.6, that I'm not going to go through because I think it's kind of confusing. But the, the, sum, the summarize this figure, it's just that C3 molecules are constantly being cleaved in the plasma and lymph and extracellular fluids at a low rate by something called the soluble C3 convertase. So let's not get into those details and uh, just look at figure 2.4 and say, however you get there, you get this low level of cleavage that's constantly happening and then most of the, the C3B is hydrolyzed by water, but occasionally you get covalent attachment to the surface here. 
Now this is where things get interesting. Here's C3B attached to the pathogen surface. <clears throat> In this form, it recruits another complement factor known as factor B, which once bound to C3B becomes an active protease, which will, uh, sorry, it's not an active protease. It becomes a substrate of a protease known as factor D. So it's already confusing, but let me go through again. C3B on the surface here will recruit factor B, change its conformation so it can be cleaved by factor D, again in serum, plasma, uh, in plasma or lymph. Factor D will, will bind and cleave factor B into two products, large B, small B, or just called BB, and then BA. BA has no further function. It doesn't recruit phagocytes, it's just inactive. But BB stays bound to C3B. For most of the complement fragments that we'll talk about, the large fragment uh, has the, design, the subscript B and the small fragment has A. So we've already seen that with C3A. You see that again with factor B. The large fragment is BB, the small fragment is BA. Now you have the alternative C3 convertase, C3B, BB. And this can cleave more C3, and we'll come back to this in a minute. But just, this is your friend, the alternative C3 convertase, pathogen surface, C3B molecule covalently attached, and now the BB fragment. Together, this is a very active protease, which will uh, come across additional molecules of C3 that haven't been cleaved at all, and cleave them. Some of them will be hydrolyzed uh, and float away, but many of those C3B molecules, because it's close to the pathogen surface, will become bound to the pathogen surface. And so, and this will stay here and continue to cleave more C3, generating a lot of C3A to recruit phagocytes and depositing a lot more C3B. Each of these can then recruit a factor B, which is cleaved, to form its own alternative C3 convertase. So that's how you amplify. As soon as you get one of these molecules and you get B, factor B cleaved to make the alternative C3 convertase, you can now generate a lot more C3B, <clears throat> and each of those can become a C3 convertase, and so on. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's how the alternative pathway gets started. A very low frequency event uh, of turnover of C3, leading to, if there's a pathogen around, you'll get C3B mark marking and then amplification through the alternative C3 convertase. Now, as I said, most of the time that deals with the, the bacteria along with the recruitment of phagocytes, you take care of the infection. But if there's still bacteria around and you get an acute phase response, that will lead to production of this protein known as mannose binding lectin or MBL. And that's the lectin pathway or MBL pathway. So this is the structure of MBL. It binds to carbohydrates that have mannose in them, which are very common on the surface of bacteria, fungi, proteo protozoa, and viruses. And the structure is like a bunch of flowers. Each of these stalks here, which just looks like one uh, chain, is actually a triple helix made from three identical polypeptides. And that's very sim similar to the structure of collagen that you have in your skin and your hair. Each MBL molecule has five or six of these, and each of them has three pathogen binding sites, or e mannose binding sites. So there's between 15 or 18 binding sites per MBL molecule. Now, some human cells have mannose on them, but they're not in the right geometry to allow binding of the MBL molecule. Because it has a structure similar to collagen and because it binds carbohydrates, so it's a lectin. Co collagen plus lectin means collectin. That's how this, this is a member of a family of proteins known as collectins that have those two properties. And we'll see another one in a few minutes. So normally, this MBL molecule diffuses around uh, together with two proteins called MASP1 and MASP2, and not much is happening until it binds pathogen. At that point, MASP2 gets activated, and it cleaves another complement component 
called C4. C4 is similar to C3 in that it has a high energy thioester bond and also that when it's cleaved it releases a small fragment C4A and a large fragment that can then bind to the pathogen surface. C4A is a, is a weak um, attractant to neutrophils. It's not nearly as important as C3A, uh, but it can have some chemoattractant chemo ability. But the important one is the C4B here. And through a complicated process that I'm not going to go into, you eventually form the classical C3 convertase. And you might ask, well, why isn't the MBL C3 convertase? As we'll see later, it's exactly the same components as you find in the classical pathway. But it's different than the alternative. These are proteins we didn't see before when C3B, BB. Now it's C4B, C2A. And this is the classical C3 convertase. And again, I don't have time or desire to get through all the details here. It, it just adds confusion. And what I think is important in all these pathways is to know what is the convertase that cleaves C3, which is the important step that activates the complement cascade. And also, what's the initiating step? So we learned the initiating step for alternative. The initiating step for MBL is the MBL molecule binding to mannose in the pathogen surface, activating these proteases, the mass proteases, and eventually depositing C4B, which can lead to the uh, binding to C2A, which forms the classical C3 convertase. And now this will cleave molecules of C3 to generate C3B and C3A, which again amplifies the complement activation. Question so far? So once the uh, C3B is attached to the pathogen surface, it goes through the uh, alternative cycle? Right. So that it's a, now you're just the same as you were back here. You have C3B, it'll recruit factor B, cleave by factor D to generate the alternative convertase. Here's a visual comparison of the classical and the alternative C3 convertases. <clears throat> they each have two proteins. Those proteins are different. They're, all of these proteins are fragments of, of uh, larger complement proteins, C3, C4, C2, and B. Uh, and uh, you just you do need to know the names of these: the alternative C3B, BB, and the classical C4B, C2A. Now, in Figure 238, it reminds us that the the acute phase response is is produced in response to IL-6, which is produced by macrophages. Uh, in response to bacterial infection. And that will eventually, IL-6 will find its way to the liver and lead to the release of MBL as well as C-reactive protein and fibrinogen, uh, which have different roles in the immune response and wound healing. And because it takes time to get the MBL released, that's why the pathway becomes important later on after the alternative pathway has uh, initiated the response. So the mannose binding lectin leads, binds to carbohydrates on the bacterial surfaces, acts as an opsonin and a complement activator. And we'll come back to the, C, actually we'll talk about the C-reactive protein now. Uh, the classical pathway was first defined in studies of antibodies and we'll return to that in a later lecture, but it can also be activated by C-reactive protein which is shown here as kind of a uh, pentagon disc here. It's also produced in the acute phase response. And what happens is that when C-reactive protein um, will, will bind to, the, to certain components of pathogen surfaces, particularly the phosphocholine component of lipopolysaccharide. And once it's bound to the surface, it recruits another member of the collectin family known as C1. C1Q is the collectin protein with the different stalks together looking like a bunch of flowers. It looks very similar to MBL, uh, has similar features, but the sequence is different. And in fact, what C1Q binds to 
this is an electron micrograph, so it really does look like that in real life. Um, what C1Q binds to <coughs> is C-reactive protein, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, when it is stuck on the pathogen surface bound to phosphocholine. Just like the MBL, C1 carries around its own proteases. These are known as CR, C1R and C1S. And this will lead to cleavage of C4. And through a similar process uh, and C4B, you, lead, you get the formation of the classical, C, uh, classical C3 convertase. Same structure here that we found with MBL. OK, so <clears throat> sorry, my voice seems to be going out on me. Any questions about the MBL or C-reactive protein activating the classical pathway? Let's talk for a moment about opsonization. Uh, Complement covers, coats the surface of bacteria and extracellular viruses even. And that makes them more easily phagocytosed. Without this coating, many bacteria are resistant to phagocytosis because they don't have a lot of um, TLR ligands, PAMP, PAMP uh, structures that are recognized by neutrophils or, or macrophages. But they do have these thick coatings or cell walls made of polysaccharides, which can serve as nucleophiles to activate the alternative pathway. Or they may have substances that can bind to C-reactive protein and so this is a way of marking the cells for phagocytosis if they're resistant to recognition by uh, toll-like receptors. The textbook has a lot of details about c different complement fragments and different receptors. Uh, so you might get bogged down if you read the text. We're not going to emphasize all those details. Only what I tell you in this lecture and anything up that comes up in a later lecture will be covered on the exams. But something that's important to keep in mind, especially again, for MCATs and, and those kinds of exams, is that there are human diseases in which there are mutations that affect the complement system. And if you have mutations affecting C3, uh, you can get really severe infections. There are other mutations affecting other complement components that tend to be uh, cause more mild diseases. But uh, you need all these to really function well, and especially C3, in order to, be, uh, to have effective immune responses. So we've activated C3. Besides optimization, why is this important? How does that lead to, uh, the, for example, the poking holes in the, in, the, in the membranes of the bacteria? So now we need to talk about C5. You've seen C1. You've seen a bit of C2 and C4. You've seen a lot of C3. C5 is an, another very important component of complement. Now, when C5 is cleaved, it forms two proteins, again, a larger fragment C5B and a smaller fragment C5A. C5A is just like C3A. It's a very important chemotractant for inflammatory cells and causes increased vascular permeability. C5B has other functions that we'll see in a moment. But first, you need to know what is the enzyme that cleaves C5? There are two C5 convertases. These are protein complexes that cleave C5. Just as there were two C3 convertases, there are two C5 convertases. The alternative C5 convertase is formed by one molecule of C3 convertase that recruits a soluble, not covalently bound, but soluble fragment of C3B. So you have one C3B that's bound to the pathogen surface. You have the BB fragment, and then a second C3B. So together, it's called C3B2BB. You see why we don't like the nomenclature. Uh, I didn't make it up. But this is the alternative C5 convertase. And rather than cleaving C3, it's, it recognizes C5. And that leads to production of C5B and C5A. We will learn the classical C5 convertase later. Uh, but for now, just know the C5 convertase is C3B times 2, one of them covalently attached, one of them not, and this BB fragment. Yeah. What's preventing it from doing the covalent bond? I think that this, this is just a, a C3B molecule that's been uh, hydrolyzed by water. 
but it has some affinity for the alternative C3 convertase and binds, and then when, once it comes together, it forms the C5 convertase. Yeah? Uh, another covalently bound C3B, I don't, th I think that would be too far uh, away on the surface, and I'm not sure if that would form the C5 convertase. Yeah? Can this compound still act as a C3 convertase? Or Can this still act as a C3 convertase? I don't think so. I suppose if the C3B fell off because it's, you know, it's going to have some on off rate, when it's off, this would be a C3 convertase again. Since it's not covalently bound, it's not going to be bound all the time. Yeah? Did you say that C5 is part of the classical uh, pathway? Or is it still part of the alternative? The C5 can be activated by either pathway. So C, it's just a, a, down, a downstream uh, component of the complement. Once you get C3 convertase converting C3 to C3B, uh, you will form this alternative C5 convertase. Uh, and you also, as we'll learn later, form a, you can form a, a classical C5 convertase. No matter how you start the pathway, you end up the same place, which is C3 conversion and then eventually C5 conversion. So this is like the convergence part of the flow chart. The convergence part happens earlier at this step. Not shown here, no matter how you get to C3 cleavage, you form a, uh, a C5 convertase. There are two forms, the alternative and the classical. But either one will cause uh, C5 conversion. Some C5A will be involved in recruitment. The C5B, its main role is in this perforation of pathogen membranes. But all of these will lead to both of those. Now, the poking holes in the membranes of bacteria is a, is a really dramatic looking process. Uh, visually pretty exciting when you, when you look at the pictures, uh, so, but it's, it's actually not that important for host defense. There's only a few strains of bacteria which seem to be controlled mainly by this, what's called the membrane attack complex. But nevertheless, it's uh, important to learn, and it's initiated by C5B. Here's some C5B here. There are actually four other components of complement, which fortunately are numbered consecutively, C6, C7, C8, and C9. And the take-home message from this slide is that C5B catalyzes or nucleates or begins the process of insertion of all these components into the pathogen membrane. Through a complex process, it positions all these later terminal, as they're called, terminal components of complement in a, in a way that can begin to poke a hole in the membrane of the pathogen. And then you get this polymerization of C9 fragments leading to formation of, of a pore. And now there's no more cell wall or lipid bilayer uh, that can control the osmotic pressure and balance. And so water can flow into the pathogen. Other things can flow out. You get these holes in the membrane, and the, and the bacteria will just explode. So I'm not, just know that these are the terminal components of complement I'm not going to ask you details about how this membrane attack complex is formed, but you do have to know the term membrane attack complex. Here's a picture of those membrane lesions using electron microscopy. Uh, but again, there's very few bacteria that, are, that, that are, form opportunistic infections in humans or animals that don't have the terminal components of complement. One exception or example of, of a class of bacteria that we do control with this is the, is the Neisseria genus that includes uh, gonorrhea bacteria and meningitis. So I'm not saying it's not important, but a lot of bacteria that we deal with, we, just the other, the other functions of complement are sufficient to take care of them. This just shows you some details if you're interested. Again, I'm not going to test you on them. These are the terminal complement components. You probably should know that C9 is the one that polymerizes uh, to, to actually form this pore. So we've learned about how the complement system coats the pathogen and how it attacks certain bacteria. What about these C3A and C5A? 
It's really very similar to what we learned for the CXCL8. Uh, but there's a new term that I want to bring in here, which is anaphylatoxin. C5A and C3A are very, very potent at causing vascular permeability, leading to fluid leakage from the blood vessels and extravasation of complement proteins, other plasma proteins, and also neutrophils and monocytes. So along with CXCL8, these uh, C3A and C5A will do this, and they're actually extremely potent at doing this. And if there's too much complement activation, you can lead to anaphylactic reactions that are similar to septic shock, where you have loss of blood pressure and potentially death. So this is where we'll take our, our short break for uh, today's lecture and talk about something that is related to the world outside of biology and, and university and talk about anaphylactic shock in popular fiction in movies. Does anybody, can anybody think of a um, book or a movie in which a key character was killed through anaphylactic shock? All right, so who's read The Da Vinci Code? Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed, come on. <laughs> it's not one of the world's great works of literature, but if you start it, you will not put it down. So, Wait till the next break, winter break, spring break, pick up this book and say goodbye to your family and friends for a few days. Um, and so one of the characters, the, t the two main characters who are played in the movie by Tom Hanks and Audrey Tautou is a French actress. He's an American anthropologist or something like that. And I don't know what she is, just a pretty face. But um, <laughs> they are trying to find the mystery of why certain people are getting killed. Uh, in front of famous paintings. And they, one of the sources who could tell them who the bad guy is has a peanut allergy. And before he's able to help them out, he's actually killed through a very clever, um, very clever murder where somebody drips some peanut dust into his drink. He can't actually taste it. And within a few seconds, he's dying of uh, asphyxiation. So. Uh, this isn't because of C3A and C5A. It's due to an allergic response. And I don't know in the movie. I, I only saw it once. I don't remember if he was shot in the movie or if they did that anaphylactic um, peanut allergy thing. But it did. A, I thought it was a pretty clever way to murder somebody in a way that they that nobody would ever, you know, trace that you did that. So. Okay. Immunology in the movies. And then back to reality. And uh, you can see that the complement system is very powerful. And it can be very dangerous, which is what I just tried to illustrate. So it's not surprising that the body has evolved ways to regulate and control complement activation. And there's a very large number of complement regulatory proteins that control and vent destruction of host cells. And also, equally important, prevent depletion of C3. If you get too much complement activation all the time uh, for the wrong reasons, you will run out of C3 that you need at a site of infection. Now, there are two classes of complement regulatory proteins. One are the plasma proteins that interact with C3B if it happens to become attached to the surface of a host cell. And uh, these will lead to degradation of the C3B. And the, some of these are called factor H and factor I. And that uh, will prevent that. So that will limit the amount of C3B that, that's active and that will, make, that will uh, deplete all the C3 in the, in, that's around. And if you lack factor I, there are patients who lack factor I. They get too much C3 convertases, and you get depletion of C3 in the blood and the lymph and the extracellular fluid. And so they actually get frequent infections. So on the top, they actually talk about another protein, preparedin, which I'm not going to talk about. But just as an example, that factor H and factor I are involved in inhibiting the activation uh, on pathogen surfaces so you don't deplete the C3. But what about preventing uh, the killing or the optimization of human cells? This occurs that if you happen to get covalent attachment of C3B and you form the alternative convertase, um, a molecule called DAF and or MCP are transmembrane proteins on the surface of our host cells that interfere with the 
the formation or the activity of the C3 convertase. It disrupts these C3 convertases and, and eventually leads to their degradation. Again, the details of these figures aren't important. The concepts I want to get across are soluble factors that limit the depletion of C3 uh, during immune responses and then these membrane, transmembrane proteins that prevent your own cells from being opsonized or killed by the membrane attack complex. And I've always liked this protein because it has my initials, DAF. Uh, and there's another one called CD59, which is specifically involved, even if you get to that point of starting to form the membrane attack complex, CD59 prevents the recruitment of the C9 proteins. So I think we're more or less on the schedule of what I expected, which is we would just barely finish the complement uh, pathway and have five minutes to talk about defensins. Uh, but is there any other question about complement before I move on? I really suggest you go back and review this because you're going to forget this nomenclature and later on you're going to f find it to be a big burden to try to go back and remember it if you don't study it right away. Okay. Defensins is another family of proteins that are produced by, in this case, many different cells in the body. They're small peptides and they have antimicrobial properties. It's a large group of them. They fall into two classes, the alpha defensins and the beta defensins. You don't need to remember their names. Uh, but the one property I want you to understand about them is they have amph amphipathic chemical property. And what that means is that the surface of these peptides have both positively uh, or hydrophilic regions as well as hydrophobic regions, just like detergents that can mix with water and oil. These are things that, have, that could, you can imagine can be, can be transported in aqueous environments but could also integrate into membranes because of this hydrophobic properties as well. That allows them to penetrate into the membranes of microbes. The other thing I want you to know about the alpha defensins is that they tend to be expressed by neutrophils and also by a specific cell type in your gut known as the paneth cell, which is near the base of the crypt uh, below the stem cells. And these are specialized epithelial cells that uh, one of their main functions is to secrete defensins. And you can see the granules here that have the defensins that are secreted all the time. The beta defensins tend to be expressed by epithelial cells, especially those of the skin, the respiratory tract, uh, and the urogenital tract. And you can see that some of them are made constitutively some are induced by infection, but there's a, a large number of them. And through their different, slightly different structures, they've evolved to uh, be effective at poking holes in the, in the membranes of different classes of pathogens. So I think that uh, we can stop here because the next lecture on adaptive immunity is not going to take the entire 50 minutes. So we can squeeze in the bit on type 1 interferons and NK cells at the beginning on a Monday. Oh, we have a question before we go. Oh. The, the, now, the PANA cells, um, I don't think that they, so unlike the other cells in the villi, they're not constantly dying off and being replaced by the stem cells. If you know, if you remember anything about physiology, you're constantly replacing the cells lining your intestinal walls, and the stem cells are the source of those cells. The panacells are long-lived cells that are at the base of the crypt that are secreting the defensins. Yes? 